Okay, so um, hello everybody. Um, so as was kind of mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the understudy of Nerd Night Orlando and someone can't show up, I show up instead and so uh, <laughs> Ricardo had a special request and uh, he said he wanted to say your brain on too many superhero movies and so at first I was like, okay, your brain on too many superheroes, got it. So um, anybody see uh, Avengers? I have, I, okay, so it's kind of like an underground documentary that came out this summer and uh, <laughs> might not have heard of it. Um, but it, it's about this guy, uh, Thanos, who is the star of the show, and uh, he kind of goes about, he, he thinks there are too many superheroes. In the, in the, it's kind of a long story short. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Um, but that was kind of what my, my talk was originally going to be about. I thought it was going to be a snap, and I had all this big old slide stuff, but ended up having to get rid of half of them. And you will understand all those jokes when you see the movie. I promise you. Um, so in any way... I had to take a step back and say, okay, so we're going to talk about something a little bit more general. I can't just be talking about one brain. We have to talk about brains. Uh, we, I wanted to, so now we're going to talk about art. We're going to talk about uh, your brains, what art does to your brains, and we're also going to touch a little bit on uh, the way art can actually drive you crazy uh, for good and for bad and how you can kind of leverage that to become the people you want to become. Uh, so the first thing uh, that came to mind whenever we're thinking about your brain on too many art things is Don Quixote, a kind of a cornerstone of Western literature. Uh, this book came out in the early 1600s, and it is, about, it is a novel about a man who reads too many novels, so he goes insane and thinks he's a character in a novel. So that's, that, that's the whole premise of all of this. And uh, it ends up, he ends up in some pretty hilarious and tragic, but also some comic situations. And one of the highlights of the story early on is where he's riding around. He thinks he's a knight. He thinks he's got to go run around and cleanse the land of evil, f fight the monsters. And he sees some windmills. And he thinks the windmills are monsters. And so he readies his lance and charges at the windmills. And uh, the windmills win, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so... I was, this is the kind of thing we're going to be getting into. So I, I kind of had to get, ask myself, what, is, what would happen to your brain if, if, we, if we kind of fast forward to kind of modern day? Uh, you know, we have everybody here who loves superhero movies, and we have, as Ricardo said, we have superhero movies. So like, what would happen if you watched so many superhero movies and ingested so many comic books that you yourself went insane and began to think that you were actually a character in a comic book film or a comic book movie? I, you know, it's just hard for us to imagine what that kind of madness <laughs> would look like. We might never actually know. <laughs> so um, a little bit about me. I'm a uh, bioengineer at Hesperos, a human on a chip company. And uh, basically what that means is we grow little miniature human organs on computer chips. And then we basically use those to replace animal testing. And, st and so it, what we can do is we can take your cells, turn them back into stem cells, and then create this whole little miniature version of your entire sort of individual ecosystem. So we can have uh, models of you that have your cells, your genes, uh, your weird medical conditions, you know, whatever. Um, we're going to be able to sort of use that to create some sort of personalized medicine as, as we sort of ha have things going forward. Um, so here's the sort of thing that I stare at all day and get paid to do it. Um, this is an example of one of the uh, like organs on a chip. These are, these are actually brain cells. These are neurons. And we've grown them on these this sort of grid of little tiny little electrodes. And so we're using these to create models of brains and study how they function, how we can, dis how we can induce dysfunction, and maybe how we can rescue them uh, from this dysfunction. That's kind of one of our main goals here. And so the interesting thing about brains and about neurons is that they are not uh, stagnant. They are constantly sort of adjusting themselves to each other. Um, here's sort of an artist's representation of a, what's called a synapse. Basically, neurons don't actually jam right up and touch and communicate dire directly to one another. There's kind of this space in between them, and then they send signals across the space in the form of neurotransmitters. And then um, what can happen is, depending upon what sort of signal like the next neuron receives, it can adjust its sensitivity to the signal that it's getting, depending on what it expects. And that's kind of going to be the key of what we're talking about here. Uh, sometimes we want we want there to be kind of uh, sort of a stability to that whenever you. Uh, Whenever you think about flexing your muscles, you kind of want it to happen one at a time. Uh, we model some dis uh, dysfunctions of the motor neuron system, um, but also we model uh, dysfunctions of the central nervous system, the brain. Uh, we model Alzheimer's, we model Parkinson's, and we sort of seek to amend these things so that we can extend the health of our brains for as long as we can. We've gotten really good at fixing most of the rest of our body, but the, that's the good news. The bad news is that a lot of us are going to live long enough to have brain problems. So that's one of the things that we're seeking to address here. 
But I'm kind of interested in, yeah, uh, what happens every day whenever we're, our healthy brains are going about uh, perceiving the world, acting in the world, and uh, staring at slides like this for way too long so you get a headache. Um, so we're going to skip that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, it's not good to show drunk people that slide, I should say. <laughs> So what I'm talking to you today is about a kind of a model of the way the brain processes information called predictive processing. Um, it basically, this is sort of like an elegant sort of tie everything together theory, sort of the way that the evolution is a sort of a tie everything together theory. It says that there is sort of a feedback uh, process between what you sense and what you expect. Your brain is constantly generating expectations of what it's perceiving, and then it sort of checks and sees whether or not the uh, sensory input that you're getting fits into those expectations. And so there's a sort of this handshake that has to occur between what your brain expects and what's actually coming in. And so that lets us do stuff like look at images like these, which are just sort of blobs of random stuff. But then once I tell you that's a dog on the left and a cow on the right, then it sort of instantly snaps into place. And then you can just look at that and sort of see that stuff instantly. Um, <laughs> so this is a Dalmatian, like kind of right here. <laughs> see now? If anybody's ever been to the Dolly Museum over there, it's kind of full of stuff like that. We were just over there. We, um, we drove down here from Orlando and checked it out. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's, that's been, Dolly was an absolute master of playing with our brain's expectations of stuff. Um, so this applies to shapes. This applies to visual images. Um, but it also applies to words. We can read this pretty well, even though the letters are messed up. <laughs> anybody, anybody having trouble? So that, that's kind of an interesting thing that a lot of what we, even our basic language is, uh, our ability to process language is uh, based on this uh, process of generating expectations. We can sort of eyeball this stuff and sort of behold the word as a whole, even though the letters are not in the, word that, in the order they're supposed to be in. And this works because uh, we have a lot of holes in our perception. You, uh, you have two holes in your eye, uh, one at the front where light can come in, but also another one at the back where the nerves that are in your eye kind of go out. You have a blind spot in both of your eyes. And so what your brain does is it's able to sort of fill in that blind spot through its expectations. You don't actually see a literal hole in your vision unless something's actually wrong. So the actual human eye is able to compensate for the fact that there are uh, patches, in our, uh, patches in our sort of understanding of the world. Magicians play with this all the time. Um, so this, sort of the harmony between our uh, expectations of the world and what we sense is determined by what we pay attention to. If you're just sort of have something off out of the corner of your eye, then there's like a broad range of sort of input that could sort of let you say, okay, that, that's what I expect. Nothing is really totally amiss. But if you're paying attention to something, that narrows the range of acceptable input. Whenever you're actually paying attention to something, that makes it a lot easier for you to detect if something is amiss. And so that's what kind of gives magic its magic, is because magicians are masters of throwing your attention around, making you pay attention to the wrong thing so they can actually execute the trick without you noticing it, because it all happens in the corner of your eye. Similarly, our brain also sort of generates uh, expectations of what it's going to feel like when we do stuff. This is kind of why you can't tickle yourself, because whenever you try to tickle yourself, your brain is like, okay, I know what this is supposed to feel like, and you kind of lose that element of surprise. Um, this is also kind of why uh, repetitive rhythmic motion can be like satisfying for some people if you see somebody doing kind of a nervous twitch. Uh, <laughs> right. Whenever you're doing that, you're generating sensory input that you know, and you know what it's going to be already. So it's comforting. It's comforting to generate stuff that you expect. I realized this while I was, you might not have noticed, I was pacing back and forth up here for about half an hour uh, before, it was, before it was time to go. And that's totally just me just sort of getting in that rhythmic space and getting ready to uh, come up here. Um, it's also why placebos kind of have their magic. If you, so, like, uh, if you expect to be in pain, that can actually make you more sensitive to be, being in pain. If you expect for a treatment to work, um, it can actually help reduce the amount of pain that you're in. I'm not saying that this is literally a 100% mind over matter kind of deal. I'm just saying that there's sort of a, a nice sort of harmony and in an interface there. Um, but it can go wrong. Uh, disorders in this sort of perceptual predictive processing system can account for a lot of what we see in stuff like uh, people with uh, autism spectrum disorders or schizophrenia. People with autism spectrum disorders are very sensitive to minute changes in whatever it is they're experiencing. Now, you know, I'm looking around, I'm, everybody here is clothed, 
as far as I can tell. And pr presumably, you're all kind of forgotten what it feels like to wear your clothes. You're not actually constantly paying attention to the bare fact that your clothes are pressing against your skin because you know what that, your, your brain kind of expects that, that say, sort of range of sensory presentation. You've sort of tuned that out. Uh, it's fine. This sort of range of feeling is acceptable and normal. But for people with uh, autism spectrum disorders, they can be driven mad by the tag on the back of their shirt because every little change in that perception is something that sort of demands their attention. They're way more sensitive to this stuff because their sort of confidence intervals of what they expect to uh, experience is a lot narrower. Uh, ditto with stuff like schizophrenia. I mentioned tickling. Uh, your brain is pretty good at, uh, at knowing what it expects to feel because you're moving. Uh, it also is pretty good at knowing what it expects to sort of sense in your head uh, whenever you're thinking things. We, we all have voices in our head, and we're totally fine with that because we identify those voices as belonging to us. But whenever you have a disorder like schizophrenia, it can actually cause problems with your brain's ability to predict the feeling of thinking. So you, you still hear these voices in your head, but suddenly you identify them as not belonging to you. It's coming from somewhere else. So that brings us to kind of our ultimate sort of question. What happens whenever you consume all of this kind of superhero art? What can this do to your brain? What can this do to the sort of predictive processing that your brain is undergoing a lot of the time? Now, Silver Age comics basically existed to kind of cancel out uh, the angry young men's desires of the day. Like, uh, you notice that a lot of what superheroes basically do is fight supervillains. Um, and that's kind of it. They exist to cancel out supervillains. Like, they don't necessarily have uh, initiatives or projects of their own. Uh, they, they, <laughs> Superman isn't carving housing out of, out of mountains for the homeless or anything like that. He basically just <laughs> emerges to cancel out a superhero, a supervillain or something like that. Um, so one of the bad ways that imbibing too many superhero, uh, too many superhero art objects can do, can do is um, it can sort of induce this sort of feeling of learned helplessness, this idea that your story is only valuable if you are one of the superheroes, if you are one of the elite, if you are born but playing by a different set of rules that gives you a broader range of action than anybody else. Um, that almost doesn't exist. That's why we invent these sort of comics to sort of keep us entertained. Um, and that's also kind of what happens in the brain whenever we experience stuff like depression uh, in, the, in this context of predictive process. If you go out and you know every business you launch fails almost immediately, every stock you buy uh, plummets to zero within seconds of you buying it, um, every date you go on they leave halfway through and stick you with the bill. Eventually, you're going to sort of re sort of recognize that you know I should probably do less stuff. I cannot predict success for myself very well. And you eventually get in this sort of uh, terrible state where it's just like the, the world outside, everything that I do is uh, going to cause just sort of chaos and uncertainty. And you feel kind of stuck. You notice people with the depression actually move slower, move with much less motor confidence. Um, people with depression also report that colors are dimmer. And that's not metaphorical. Like their brains literally are processing the information that's coming in a lot differently. But the, one of the, the flip side of that is something that's very good and something that you actually can get from superhero, no, uh, superhero comics, I almost said superhero novels. Um, you can read those if you want. But that is learned helpfulness. If you are feeling down, if you don't like who you are, the best way to build your self-esteem is to perform esteemable acts, do esteemable things, and sort of take that uh, model of like predicting what you're going to do and use that knowledge to say, okay, I am capable of doing these things, start small, uh, start, and, and sort of let this sort of process of positive feedback carry you forward and build you up. And this is something that you can get from superheroes, but it's also something that's available to absolutely everybody. Everybody here has a story to tell. Everybody here has overcame something. Everybody here has something to share. And everybody here is, no matter who you are, no matter what your story is, you're able to share your story. And people are going to be able to take your story and apply that to their own life and maybe gain some insight from it that they might not have been able to conjure for themselves. And that, to me, is what brings so much magic to Nerd Night and why is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it is because everybody here has a story. Everybody here has a passion. And if you take nothing else away from this, just remember that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, uh, you can do this too. So thank you, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.